Well, let me start by thank Professor Plezo and the other organizers for setting up this nice conference and giving me the opportunity to present a project which I did actually two and a half years ago with Martin Reuter. Uh, I will skip all the references in the following, since you can find them here to clear up the slides. And I decided to actually give you another introduction. Oh, it's working here. Yeah. Uh, to the main problem and uh, yeah, conceptual issues which arise once we study background field independence within the realm of quantum gravity. So most of my talk will actually be part of an introduction since I decided to put all the technical details of our uh, work aside and focus later on only on two main aspects which yep, are probably then the conclusion of this talk. So I hope to be in time that I really can make my point. Ah. So um, as we all know in quantum field theories we are really requiring our theory to be background field independent in order to have a full prediction uh, of the dynamical decrease of freedom. So if you violate background field independence, then you have to have somehow justify it why you pick this particular background field and not any other one. And in order to avoid this, yeah, if you don't have any physical justification for this, uh, you have to follow a background field independent approach. Now let's go to gravity and start with the classical theory, actually. So GR is known to be manifest background field independent, and since we're now dealing with a metric field, it's also the same as talking about background geometry independent. This part of the geometry which is fixed uh, a priori. This is a topology and a differential structure, which you need in order to define a well-posed mathematical differential equation. Nevertheless, we are not considering these objects to be the dynamical decrease. And as such, we really can talk about a manifest background independent approach in this context. What I want to now emphasize is something which we also encounter when studying the FRGE, namely when we approximate an exact equation. So in this, for instance, we can perturb around a certain field, we call it a background field. And what we, what we see is if we truncate now the field equation to a certain order, that the observables will depend on this background field and as such we have a clearly background dependent approach. This can always happen, uh, always fail. Once we have a perturbation or a kind of approximation to exact equations, we can might lose easily this nice property. Now, uh, going to what we actually want to study, namely the quantum theory of gravity. There are many different proposals for uh, approaching this problem. What they all have in common is basically that, in contrast to quantum series of matter, we are now considering space-time to be the dynamical degree of freedom. As such, we are now, again, uh, having the problem that background field independence goes hand-in-hand -hand with background geometry independence. So, let's say we take a metric field, uh, tensor field, uh, in order to define our dynamical degrees of freedom, then this one also defines our geometry and should be a full prediction by our uh, proposal in the, in the very end. So the problem is then that in usual uh, approaches to quantum uh, theories, we make heavily use of a prefix or a preset geometry. So in order to find equal time commutators, time direction uh, on its own, or even scales in the end, which we need for the RG, we have to have a notion of a geometry in the very beginning. So that has led to many different proposals where you start off by putting background geometry at the very outset, so at the starting point, and depart from the standard methodologies. And this leads then to yeah, what we would call manifest background independent approaches of which CT, loop quantum cosm uh, gravity, and causal sets are particular examples. Now, we want to stay closer to the standard prescription, and what we can do is we can make use of the background field method, which we already heard uh, in the previous talk about, so the general idea is unrelated to gravity at the beginning. So what we actually want to consider is, a, let's say, on a formal level, this is a sketchy way how to, how to describe the background field method anyway. But what we want to discuss is basically, um, or compute, is a functional integral over the physical sector of our fields. And so we know when we study the whole set of Riemannian matrix, that it's much too much. This is full field space, so we have a a lot of redundancy generated by the group of gauge transformations. So studying this object, we somehow have to restrict ourselves to a certain 
Okay, I'm not talking about privilege problems also, but to a certain clo global section of this bundle over there. And if we do this in a certain way, then we can construct the observables. However, we have to make sure in the end that our observables do not depend on the particular gauge fixing hypersurface we have chosen. And this is in, in principle uh, difficult to test then. However, what we can use then is we pick randomly one particular point here in field space and we call it the background field. And based on this background field, we then construct gauge fixing, hyper, uh, gauge fixing condition and the corresponding hypersurface equations. Uh, and if we do it in a consistent way, then we see that the observables, in fact, will not depend on whether, whether or not we move our entire construction by applying uh, gauge transformation, even also in addition to this background field. So the vertical movement along the, or, or along the fiber basically uh, doesn't affect the observables. This is quite fine. However, what we also have to ensure now, we have introduced this additional field, and our observable should not depend also on the position of the background field on the uh, horizontal uh, axis, basically. So we did, uh, need additional uh, criterions to ensure this, and here background independence adds up uh, the missing direction, basically, so we require that for fixed dynamical field, the observable should not depend on a particular background field chosen. So this is a general idea, and with this you can then have a consistent construction how um, get to get a gauge invariant effective action, basically. Uh, in gravity now, and this is also particularly useful, and since now we have a particular field in the construction itself, which we can then use to define quantum theories in the end. So, so in uh, gravity, we, using this background field methods, we now have a reference geometry, so we can define scales. Later on, if we study FRG, then we can define the a scale k, we can, uh, if, we do, uh, if we have this background field, then we can really, with a scale k, also define a consistent notion what is ultraviolet and infrared. It doesn't change during the dynamics. Uh, what, what makes it also difficult in the end, uh, and I will mention this point at several occasions, is that in gravity, we don't know yet what the underlying measure is. So in the FRG, in, in fact, we will later on have to reconstruct the underlying measure from the uh, corresponding trajectory we're looking at. Okay, now coming to the Wetterich equation written down for uh, gravity using the background field uh, method. In this case, we see, okay, clearly we now have an effective average action depending on both the dynamical field and the background field. And in particular, the cutoff now depends, as Jan already pointed out, on the background field, so it sets a scale, basically, how to integrate out uh, the modes. Now, solving this equation is, as you know, no, uh, very hard. Uh, let's say we have done so, then we are only interested in those trajectories or those solutions to this equation, which lie within the finite dimensional UV critical hypersurface of a suitable fixed point. This will then define candidates for quantum field series. However, as you see, these are still dependent on two metrics in this context. So there's some, some kind of inconsistency yet, or not inconsistency, but some missing ingredients, basically. So we have to put in additional requirements, and these are exactly those which we uh, have constructed in the previous slide. So we want to have uh, constraints on the set of solutions which implement background independence and gauge invariance. And for instance, we could also ask ourselves, okay, can we restrict by, do we have to restrict ourselves further by requiring that Series, the underlying series should be unitary, is the classical limit uh, satisfied, and so on and so on. Um, yeah, I'm not going to, uh, in too much detail about this, so John Paolo already pointed out that the word identities are compatible with the uh, functional realization group equation. That means when they are satisfied at one particular scale, then they hold for any other scale for a particular solution. But this is only on the exact level, and once we apply approximation, this might easily fail and will in fact fail then. Uh, a special limit of this water identities we are now considering, only the second one, since they are of interest in this talk, is a limit when k goes to zero, where we have our effective action, and there, the, uh, if, if the water identities are satisfied, there we can then conclude that the series background field independent, on, in this case, on also background geometry independent. Okay, let's have a short look at the water identities for split symmetry. Um, as John Paolo already pointed out, so in general you can construct or you can decompose your dynamical field in a background field and a fluctuation field. 
Uh, we will here just uh, look at the linear split, what also Jan already did. So um, we split the field in the background field and, and, the, and the fluctuation field, and there's no geometrical additional contribution of higher terms in H, uh, H bar, actually. Yeah. So if you then look for the underlying or for the related water identities, you get this equation over here. And I only want to make two short comments. So still, so you can only address the question whether or not this uh, action functional uh, satisfies the water, water identities once you study bimetric functionals. Since clearly you want to measure how the different effects for the dynamical and the background coupling uh, differ in the approach. And this you're measuring here on the left hand side. And furthermore, there's a, this additional piece over here. This is a total action which appears under the, uh, in the measure. So in a way, we have to reconstruct this from a particular trajectory in the end. Good. Uh, since this equation is probably as hard as the function and realization group, we will have only a closer look to a very particular approximation to this one. And this is the split symmetry at three level. So we approximate this, uh, uh, this equation at three level, meaning that we are looking for the BST invariant part of the effective action to have no background independence. And we are not interested in the full or in full solution satisfying this criterion. But in fact, we are looking only at the limit k going to zero since there's a physical part. And we, okay, in, in a way, we are almost sure that on intermediate scale, there should be a violation in the very end. Okay, so that is our truncation. We start off, as I said, bimetric in nature. So we have one Einstein-Hilbert term constructed purely by the background metric, one by the dynamical one. We have four independent couplings. So the theory space or the naive theory space we start off is four-dimensional. And then we plug it in into the Wetterich equation. We solve, we try to solve for uh, trajectories which are emanating in the ultraviolet, so k going to infinity from a suitable fixed point. And in the infrared, we now demand that the series are background independent uh, in the approximation I just mentioned, namely on tree level. And this, in this, for this truncation, this is just corresponds to the vanishing of this first term in the limit k going to zero, meaning that all dimension full coefficients have to vanish. And a priori, we don't know uh, if there's at all one trajectory which satisfies this criterion since we're not working with a dimensionless coupling, basically. So it might be that this is not compatible with this truncation. It might be also that we find solutions, but they're not connected to the fixed point. So we have to check if there is a hint uh, already at the level of the Einstein-Hilbert um, truncation. So now we come to the actual results of the, uh, uh, of the project I did with Martin. Um, the technical details are very involved, so we have to solve this uh, biometric uh, function minimization group equation in a certain way, the new techniques which we elaborated on. But anyway, in the end, what we're interested in is now checking if there is a fixed point or not, a non-Gaussian fixed point compatible with our requirements, so having a classical limit. And we indeed find one, so in the ultraviolet, we found a set uh, of solutions, namely all trajectories which have initial data with a positive Newton coupling, they uh, emanate in the ultraviolet from this fixed point. So, so far about asymptotic safety. Now, what about background independence? And therefore, we have to check if there are solutions uh, in the infrared, so at the opposite side of the scale, which, uh, for which the dimension full coefficient actually vanished. And so what we did basically is we first noticed that the dynamical sector decouples from the background sector. We could solve these two differential equations first. We plug them in in the background sector, and then we look for exactly the properties we I just uh, mentioned. It turned out that the only way how we can ensure that uh, the dimension full coefficient vanish is if we put ourselves on a very particular point in phase space, which is what we call the running UV tractor. And this is, the, per definition, the point that comes up when we solve the now k-dependent beta functions for the background sector and set them to zero. So it basically determines the entire flow of the background sector when we move on in the scale from k0, uh, k0 to infinity. So uh, we, the requirement of background independence basically uh, fixes the background sector completely. We have no choice in this. So we get a two-dimensional reduction of all possible theories in the end. And now the only thing we have to test in order to see if both uh, constraints are compatible 
yeah, we have to see if there's a non-trivial overlap, basically, of initial data. And you can clearly see there is one. So starting off with a four-dimensional naive theory space, we have then the constraint of asymptotic safety, just puts ourselves to the positive part of the uh, Newton coupling. Then we look for background independence. We see this, this Newton coupling is also positive, so it's compatible with the, for the, uh, with the former condition. And in the end, we end up with a two-dimensional subset of now what we consider physical relevant theories. So instead of having to fix four free initial parameters, we now only have to do it for two. So what I, let's say, want to emphasize at this point is that there is quite a remarkable uh, thing happening here, namely that there's this particular point, a mathematically uh, particular point of the beta function or differential equations, which actually guarantees uh, us on the one hand side background independence and guy acts on the ultraviolet as a fixed point or as a uh, background part of the fixed point. And what we would be interested in is actually, is there a general mechanism underlying this uh, topological structure which actually in, this, in a way implements a background independence part in the FRGE itself. So this brings me to my conclusion. So in quantum gravity, we now have the problem that mm, geometry is also part of the dynamics. So this brings on us into a lot of difficulties, but we can apply the background field method. Now this also sets up a scale for, for instance, defining uh, the cutoff in our setting. Uh, it's not, not only defined for, or not only necessary for constructing gauge invariant effective average actions, but we also then have this reference geometry as I just said. The underlying water identities are as involved uh, as in the effort GE itself. They will test the extra background dependence, and what we did actually was only considering the tree level of this equation. We looked for solutions to the equation which are asymptotically safe, and background dependence, we found one uh, with increased predictivity. And what was striking us was that there is a kind of mathematical underlying object only for this truncation so far uh, considered, but it might be that it's generalized to some other, that is a more deeper physical reason behind this running UV attractor. So what I think is related to future tasks is surely the holy grail of the FRGE, namely finding uh, error estimates for truncations if possible at all. Probably you need uh, help from mathematics departments also. But uh, what I want to stress at this point, okay, we could start and develop truncations or design truncation just based on one of the exact properties we already know for the FRGE, for instance, the water identity for split symmetry, and then uh, construct such truncation, consider them, uh, or consider flow equation, solve them. How we cannot be sure without such a criterion or a related criterion if we improve actually on the truncation itself, since we have a lot of exact, or we have different exact properties and improving of one on one might be on the fail of, of the other one. Another issue is surely then when we want to com uh, study the complete water identities for gravity, we have to solve the reconstruction problem in a way or approximate it in a way. That would be then we can go to the next order above tree level and test uh, the water identities. And surely what is probably most accessible is uh, establish new techniques uh, for studying actually biometric truncations, makes them more simple or on the level of the simplicity of single metric truncations, that we have more results and actually can test if there are um, structures like this present uh, in the end. Okay, with this I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.